going to listen now to the word of God um, in obedience to his promise that uh, when we dwell richly in his word, his will, word will dwell richly in us uh, and we're going to explore together this whole idea of Jesus being our peace. The first reading of this Tina is reading from Isaiah. First reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and also 5 to 7. There will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, the Lord humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living on the, in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I don't know um, about you, but I reckon that's one of the greatest prophetic announcements that has ever been made. Isaiah writing a thousand years before Christ. You know? And to be honest, if God gave me a revelation of that kind, I'd probably have to go and lie down for a couple of months. <coughs> what an insight, what a blessing, what an amazing thing. And I particularly wanted to use the whole of the, and I've left bits out, <laughs> but I wanted to begin with to have us find in, because so often at this time of year we have this beautiful reading and it always starts at um, verse 6, mm -hmm. or 2 of the chosen, and we miss such power in that verse 5. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I watch my TV screens at the moment, and this is, this is what I keep remembering. Every warrior's boot used in battle. All those sickening, horrendous images that we can see. Not just in Israel and Gaza and the, and, the, and the West Bank, but actually all over the world. The tension of the world is on Israel for understandable reasons, but it's literally all over the world. Warrior's boots. And some of the stuff that we've been hearing is, yeah, there's no room in my head for it. It's sickening. And, and to know that. That's going to be just going to be burned up, rolled up, burned up, gone, gone. Fuel for the fire. That's the whole thing. That's really it? Because of the coming of this child. And I can imagine sitting in the long hours of the night, if I was up, I suddenly, <coughs> I'm not obviously, but if I was thinking, what does that mean? A child? What does that mean? A child? And, and, and I think when the angels were singing on Christmas Day, there were the serried ranks of the gorgeous angels, you know, the warrior angels, the fearsome angels, and I reckon stacked up behind them all the prophets, going, Yes! This is what he meant! You know? Anyway, that's just me, and I'll lose my voice. And Ian, would you like to read the second meaning? We're going to hear from Paul in Ephesians after the after the beginning part of this prophecy has happened, Jesus has been born and the Holy Spirit has come and the church is now um, um, full of life and in existence across the Jewish and now the, the rest of the world, the Gentile world. And in the reading, I've, what I've done is I've left, Paul's amazing, but he does fill his stuff with a lot of stuff. So I'm teasing out a few verses from Ephesians that fit with our theme of peace. Go back and read the verses I left out. 
These are verses from Ephesians chapter 2. Because of his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Remember that once you were separate from Christ. Now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. And so through him, both Jew and Gentile have access to the Father by one Spirit. In him you are all being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Let's read that again. In him you are all being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Himself is our peace. And Jesus Christ has made not simply the way to heaven, but actually placed us, as one of the verses I left out, placed us in the heavenly places with, with Christ by His Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? His Holy Spirit is in us, and we're called to connect together and to connect others to the love of God in Jesus, the peace of God in Jesus, the joy of God in Jesus, the hope of God in Jesus, by the power of the Spirit. So I promised you a short thought. That's not it. <laughs> there is more, depending on how my voice goes. Finding peace in a broken world. There are lots of talk. In um, the United Nations, in media outlets, in various uh, governments, about finding a peace plan. And uh, we've been here before, haven't we? A million times before, and uh, we can't even agree <laughs> as humanity on a, on a peace plan. And I, I kind of want to say it's simplistic, I know, but I kind of want to say, yeah, because until you have Jesus for the forefront and centre of every decision that is being made, you're not going to have peace. Jesus is God's peace plan. There is no other route to peace. There is no other plan other than Jesus. So if you're sitting here wanting to find peace, in whatever your world looks like right now, then the simple answer let's all go home is Jesus is your peace. Okay? <laughs> but it's not as easy as all of that. That, you know, requires unpacking for all sorts of reasons. The peace of the Lord be with you. You can flush out those who've had some form of a liturgical background there, can't you? <laughs> the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. It's, um, it's not often noticed, you know, till it's either lost and then we don't have it anymore. Or suddenly it arrives on angels' wings, and we go, whoa, peace. <laughs> it's often pictured by artists as that kind of elusive butterfly, you know. I remember listening to R.T. Kendall talking about how um, 
he wasn't able to write a sermon one year when he wanted to write a sermon. I think it was on peace. And he'd been really grumpy and they'd been really busy and he'd shouted at his wife and he'd shouted at the kids. He probably shouted at the cat who was trying to climb to the top of the Christmas tree. And he couldn't write his sermon. And I laughed because the Lord showed him a picture of the dove of peace that was sitting on the garage roof. <laughs> it's not left him, but it had kind of taken a bit of a distance. <laughs> and so he went downstairs and he apologised. Ian, I am sorry. <laughs> He apologised for shouting at his wife, he apologised to the kids, he apologised to the cat and the dog and anyone else who could be from they went up upstairs and he glory to God and then he wrote his sermon. Peace, his absence is frequently noted and lamented, isn't it? Peace. It's present, funnily enough. It's rarely broadcast. I mean, how often did you switch the news on and, and it began with good news, peace broke out in love? You know, it's very, very easy to get a very unbalanced understanding of the world. God's kingdom is in operation. There are people of peace in every nation. There are people of peace in this village. Peace breaks out. Quite regularly, but it's not broadcast all that often. But peace is vital, it's essential, it's an important gift and a vital tool for disciples, for anyone who is interested in whole life stewardship, looking after your life well, knowing when you have peace and knowing when it's gone. That kind of gap there. It's a really crucial thing to be, be aware of. But it's not enough to just be aware of that. If you're not careful, the enemy comes crashing in with it. Eh, eh, look at you, shouting at your husband. You have to have the capacity to put it back. Which means you have to go back to Jesus and go back to his word and understand that in his world, it's free. It's true. He's paid the price. The cost, grace, has been paid. You just need to go, yeah, I fess up here, stuffed up, my piece left me, it's currently sitting on the roof, <coughs> of the roof of the shed. So, how do we get this back? Spend time with God, spend time with this work, all right, so you know what we're doing. So, let's move through this now quite quickly, I hope. Do you know so often? I really, I really wish God wouldn't give me these words. I, I, I mean, I don't really, I don't mean that. <laughs> but just sometimes, you know, what? Galatians 6 verse 7, really, people of God, please don't shoot the messenger, but this is where he wanted to begin. Don't be deceived, says Paul, for what you plant will always be the very thing you harvest. She, I reckon Juliet, this isn't prophetic, she will probably work out who I'm going to quote next. There's a guy called John Paul Jackson, God's glory. He said this, peace is the pot in the soil of revelation. We prayed earlier to God about granting us a fresh revelation of his beauty and his mercy. Uh, wow. Begins in peace. We have to understand and grasp hold of the truth, truth of the fact that God in Christ is our peace. It's got nothing to do with how we feel. It's got nothing to do with the tree that blew down in the garden last night in the storm. It's got nothing to do with your feelings, although your feelings are involved. It's actual truth, spiritual truth, he is our peace. We can choose to stand in that or step out of that. And if we're not investing in the things of peace, what will we be growing in our lives? This is really practical 
theology. So, we bemoan the absence and the lack of peace, but if we want it, and especially if we want the peace that comes from a revelation of God, then we go in best in cultivating peace. Peace, if you like, the soil of faith, the sustenance of our inner life, the thing that is intended to equip us for life, not here, but with Him in what is to come. So why? Well, it's quite simple. Why must we invest in peace? Because God did. Because God did. He invested his whole self in it, actually, in Jesus Christ. Now, there will be uh, a support piece of paper going out with some further teaching and Bible verses and some activities that you can do. And I really would recommend that you actually do invest in cultivating the soil of your life and exploring that. It will be sent out probably today, I think, if Juliet's got a lot of time along with, with the talk. So moving on, how do we find peace? And I actually think it's more an attitude of mind um, in terms of how, and this is a really short summary of what the um, preaching support material will, will go into in depth. So, the first thing is really simple, but it passes us by. We need to choose to focus on God, and that's a choice. And, and as part of that choice, we need to choose to become less obsessed with ourselves. I really wish you didn't give me these things to say. <laughs> you know, it kind of is all about you. He died for you, and if you were the last person on earth, and all that kind of stuff, it is, but it's not. <laughs> it's all about him. And the peace in your heart will grow stronger and deeper and richer and more fertile the more that you become focused on God. So what do you do? You invest. God invested in you in Christ. So you invest your life in him. And I'm not being funny, but how much TV have you watched this week? How much time online shopping have you done this week? How much time have you spent in the shops this week? How much time have you spent to sleep this week? All of the things that we do with our time, and by the way, I'm not knocking any of those things. I'm just saying on balance, if you can see those as a little graph, how much time have you spent with Jesus on your own with him? Talking to him, aka prayer, reading his book, telling him that you absolutely don't understand why he he loves you, but you love him back. Worship. And, and I think that's a real challenge because if we really want to whole life disciples, we really want to get this peace and to know where to get it when it goes in my tiny shed roof. Then we have to have strategies, tools and techniques and come back to his word. Come back, ask his spirit to lead you back to the place of peace, which is Jesus. Okay? Number, oh, there's a verse here um, that was also from Isaiah. I'm preaching a lot from Isaiah. This is what Isaiah says. Do not yield, this is Isaiah 41 verse 10, sorry, she said that. Do not yield to fear, because I am always near. Never turn your gaze from me, for I am your faithful God. I will infuse you with my strength and help you in every situation. I will hold you firmly with my victorious right hand. Give it up for the prophetic worship leader. <laughs> Strength will rise and wait upon the Lord. Okay, so this is the second way, the second kind of attitude, I suppose. Um, having chosen to not focus on us and, and focus on God, this becomes the kind of $60 million question, just how much are we focused on God? Um, are we followers of the way with a small w or followers of the way with a big 
W, because if we're followers of the way with the big W, it will show in everything. It will flow out of everything. And when it doesn't, you'll recognise it. You, your connection will have, have dropped off. And you'll know that you need to get back to Jesus, who is the place of peace and the provision of provider of peace. So all of that will also speak volumes to the people around you. Right? Like we, we have to understand that we, well, as I said, some of you might have got up this morning and found yourself to be practically perfect in every way, but that wasn't me. It wasn't me. Only in the eyes of the Lord, because I've probably already messed up in some way, shape, or form. But, you know, but the, the kind of the, the point here is people expect us to be holier than that. Right? They expect us to be judgmental in, as well. And, and also expect us to get everything right. And they expect us to go, ooh, we don't like that. And also, they'll judge us even if they don't say anything. You know, so if you've left a, a, a blast on your slip, on your lip, you know, you cut your hand off with a chainsaw and you say, oh dear, yeah. and other words, that, oh, I thought you were a Christian. The very first thing that my brother said to me when I became a Christian, I came and went, I've become a Christian. He went, ah, oh, really? And then, um, and he hit me. And I went, so the word I shouldn't have said, and he went, Call yourself a Christian. <laughs> and then I was angry. It got worse and worse and worse. And my point really is that people need us to be real. People really need to be real. You know, God calls you holy. He has made you holy. The rest of the world, it, well, isn't quite sure what that means. You might be a bit weird, a bit strange, a bit different. You might actually stuff up and say, Do you know, I'm really sorry, I stuffed up. What is it about our current culture? I've been watching this stuff about Hillsborough. Um, and that's just a symptom of so many people just can't acknowledge they've messed up. They, can't, they just can't say, sorry, I did this, I did do this, I've got a whole raft of reasons why I did this. People can swear, I didn't mean to be mean, but I was mean. So say sorry. And when people see that, they're like, oh, oh. You Christians are supposed to get it all right. You can have a conversation off the back of that, can't you? Practicing reconciliation. Anyway, I promise it wasn't going to be wrong. Um, why? Well, it's obvious. Here's another quote from my bio. I've dignified this one by actually putting it on the screen. He was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. Why should we put Jesus first in our lives? Because he put us first. And that means we must invest, invest in fellowship, hanging out with other Christians, learning from them, encouraging them, bringing words to them, hearing words back. It means investing in service, doing stuff like that. We need to bridge. Is just one example. I witness. Speak of him. He spoke of you so often. I've come for love of you. Just talk about me with people. He said the two greatest commandments to love God is with your heart, mind, body, and strength, and to love one another in the same way. Love involves all of those things and all right. the time. The third way. Oops. The third way is simple, it's an act of will, it's a decision. Um, it's hard because the emotions will come crashing in big time. And I, I would probably say this is the, the, the thing out of all of them that. Challenges me the most. Choosing to be a peace activist. <laughs> um, the verse from Isaiah, I love it, I'm going to read it to you because I didn't put it on screen. Um, Isaiah says this Why do we do all of these things? It's kind of the thing we've been talking about. He says, Because the fruit of righteousness will be peace, its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. Better on the confidence than the quietness. 
Isaiah 32, verse 17. Do you notice how you can't talk about any one of these Advent themes without mentioning the others? Do you notice? They're all, all linked. Light, joy, love, hope, peace, righteousness, confidence, quietness, because they're all fruits of the Holy Spirit. They all come from a life that is filled by the Spirit. So it's about planning other people's peace. Park yours for a bit. <laughs> it's a real challenge, you know. He did say that to the Lord this morning, but he said, preach it anyway. Invest in other people's peace and you'll get peace. Because you'll be finding Jesus is in that with you. Proverbs 12, verse 20. Those who plan peace have joy. Get plans for peace this week. Matthew 5, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I really like Henry now, the Joyce. She's a Christian. She's like a child of God. And I could have said anything, by the way, I'm sorry. And then Ephesians 4 again, for he himself is our peace, who has made us one and broken down in his flesh on the cross. The dividing the wall of hostility. If God is not hostile towards us, what right have we to be hostile to anyone? It's a big teaching, isn't it? It's a big teaching. So, coming up, Lamb, you're going to do a bit for it yourself. Develop the lifestyle of making the Lord our refuge, and then we will live in His peace. Seconds. Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Abide means, you know, be really, really rooted in the presence of, really, really coming under the covering of, really, really, really deeply under the authority of, abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in whom I trust. When bad stuff happens, which it will, this is a broken world. Remember, we're here seeking peace in a broken world. The world is broken. I could list why it's broken. I don't need to tell you. We all come up against that brokenness. But to be able to say in the midst of all of that, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The greatest act of faith and peace that you could do, and it's an incredible witness to others. So, over to you. We have got only two volunteers. Well, some volunteers there. Eh? <laughs> okay, so in a moment, you will all need one white piece of paper and one yellow piece of paper each. Don't, just one of each, so you can give one to everyone, and you can one to everyone. And then, this is what you're going to do. You're going to join with the angels, and you're going to think about what this verse that you've got in front of you, I can say about. One from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. What is it saying to you today? What is it saying to us as Connect? And what is it saying to the world? And I just invite you now to move your chairs. And this is online where what I'd like you to do is find whatever verses of scripture that you can, it might be ones I've mentioned already, that talk about peace. Ask the Lord, the Spirit to guide you. Find them in your in your Bible. And just think and ponder. Maybe you can note online, you can write Ian is there and he will he will um, Compare, that's not the right word, but you know what I mean. So join in the conversation. So what I want you to do is get together in threes. No more than three, because you, you will only get the chance, I think, to talk maybe about one or two or three of your, your verses. So, have a look, read them. And let's pray, let's just pray. Holy Spirit, thank you. 
that you inspired so many people to write down incredible things about our God, to record the life of Jesus so that you could know it and read it and live it. So by your power, we ask, could you open our eyes to these verses you just got randomly? Could you shout out from one of them that it matters somehow? You may not know how, and you may need to talk about that with someone else right now, but one of them particularly is, is your gift this morning to us. And then ask the Holy Spirit to open your heart to the person sitting next to you so that together you can weigh the world and find peace. Amen.